if someone asking me what is your favorite gift i would say my favorite gift is taking children to school finding them education that would be my best gift in the world seeing the world change seeing my community change makes me very happy makes me forget my past makes me feel like i've done something good to change the world this is the radio vagabond welcome to part 2 of a mini series with three episodes from the Acholi quarter in Kampala Uganda if you've heard the first one you would know that this is a community with challenges and they're getting help from a foundation called 22 stars they also make jewelry out of recycled paper and 22 stars help them sell it around the world you should go back and listen to that before this one if you haven't heard it In my work with these episodes, every time I've read up on the Acholi Quarter, it's been referred to as a slum. Maybe it's just me, but I really don't like that label. So I looked into what technically can be classified as a slum area. Here's what I found. The housing units in slums are usually substandard and lack basic amenities such as clean water, sanitation, ventilation and electricity. Slum areas are characterized by high population density, with many people living in small spaces. And they typically lack the access to basic services such as health care, education, and sanitation facilities. Slums also often have poor infrastructure, including unpaved roads, limited or no access to public transport and inadequate sewer system. Plus, often with a high level of poverty and unemployment which can lead to social problems such as crime, drug abuse and other forms of social deprivation. Yes, with that definition, the Acholi Quarter in Kampala, Uganda, where I am in this miniseries, can be classified as a slum. But it is so much more. It's also a vibrant and lively neighborhood that bursts with energy and personality. The Ekoli Quarter in Kampala, Uganda is commonly referred to as a slum. While this may be factually accurate, the use of the term slum can also be seen as stigmatizing and degrading to the residents who live there. So, instead of using the term slum, it may be more appropriate to use terms such as informal settlement or underserved community. From the moment I step foot in this bustling community, I'm swept up into the sights, sounds and smells of everyday life. In this episode, I'll take a walk in the area with Susan and Nicholas from 22 Stars. It's an organization that has done much in recent years to improve the living conditions in this area, such as initiatives to provide better housing, sanitation and access to services. In the latest episode, they told me about the microloans to help small local businesses. And in this one, they're showing me some of them. My name is Palapo. Welcome back to Kampala, Uganda. The ultimate destination for armchair travelers who are looking for inspiration to get out into the real world and let loose their wanderlust. This is the Radio Vagabond. The air is filled with a delicious scent of sizzling street food with vendors selling everything from grilled meat skewers to piping hot samosas and, of course, Rolex. I'll get back to that. On the walk around the area, Susan shows me some of the small businesses that are benefiting from the 22 Stars microloans. First, we meet Ashan Grace, who has a small food stand. She's one of our beneficiaries. Uh Uh, She has uh, one child in the project. She is also benefiting from the small loan business. Uh, she was making bids before, but uh, because of this uh, corona situation, she had to turn back to selling food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she's doing very well. She's also with us in the saving, and she's paying very well. She goes to the, the big town and uh, buy this in bulky from the town. Then when she brings it here, she splits them into small quantity 
so that it can meet the level of the community because uh, here in the community no one can afford to go to the supermarket and buy in a high price but when they buy in bulky from the vehicle and they bring it here so this one is sold at 100 shillings and this one is sold at um, uh, two for 300 shillings afoyo means thank you yeah. <laughs> quarter is more than just a hub of activity it's also a place of incredible resilience and strength I see that very clearly when Susan introduces me to Abdul Dorian, who runs her business from early morning despite being disabled. She's making the typical popular Ugandan street food called Rolex. It consists of a roll chapati filled with eggs and vegetables, and the name Rolex has nothing to do with the luxury watch brand, but is a combination of the words rolled and eggs. She makes uh, omelettes. Oh. And uh, chapati. Rolex. Rolex. Yeah, Rolex. Yeah. She has uh, three, two kids are sponsored by us. Yeah, and she's doing this. She's, um, she has a, she's a disability, but she has not let the disability put her down. No. She's a very strong woman. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So she's here. Very early at six, she's already here until afternoon. She rests for for some two, three hours, and then she's back again in the evening, so that she can sell enough and save. Yeah, yeah enough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The community was originally established by refugees fleeing from the conflict in the northern Uganda, and despite facing immense challenges and obstacles. They have created a thriving and tight-knit community. She's also one of our beneficiaries. She also makes paper beads, but she also sells this. Because during uh, the COVID-19 situation, uh, we had the challenges for the beads uh, market. So she had to turn in selling this, and she's mostly concentrating in ginat paste. This is ginat paste. It can act as butter. Ginat paste. Uh-huh. Yeah, it can act as butter. You can uh, it can act as a meal. You can prepare it as a meal. You can add it to any sauce. Yeah, you can also put it on the bread. It's very nice. Mm-hmm. Like Hakim Harriet, who has a vegetable stand and is also one of the beneficiaries of the Twenty Two Stars program. Um, she mostly deals in vegetables. She sells vegetables, but I think right now it's done. She has a very high customers. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have different types of vegetables. We have here the okra. We have this one called bo. And we also have the hibiscus. We have also okra in the version of the leaves. Yeah. 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 For you. <laughs> oh, that's so I learned quick. Yeah. Next is Lai Pashka, who also has a food stand. And uh, you, you, have, you are a bit late. This is corn mixed in beans. Uh-huh. We call it nyoya. It's a very nice food. So they eat it a lot. Uh, you see, like she's eating, just you apply salad and it is very nice. Yeah, you, if you eat this now, you don't get hungry very soon. You 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 gain lot of energy, yeah. lot of strength. I think if we put it, it is carbohydrates and protein. Yeah. Many have started their own businesses, from retail shops to tailoring shops to hair saloons, outdoor shops selling everything from vegetables to prepared street food. And now we're walking inside Mr. Udungsam's shop. This is Sammy's business. Uh, this is my shop. It's my business. I have a lot. Mm-hmm. I feed my kids. I rent. I cater for medication. Oh, yes, because I have uh, at least five children. Yeah, but two are being sponsored by Twenty Two Star. Yeah, three I'm paying. Yeah. So through the loan I'm receiving from Twenty Two Star, I buy my stock. When it reaches time for school fees, I deduct some money. I take to school to pay other kids. 
yeah. who are not in the program. Okay. But those one who are in the program, the, the organization pays for them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why our beneficiaries who are sponsored by 22 stars benefit directly from 22 stars. But their families benefit indirectly from 22 stars. Like he said, he pays, the, uh, he gets the loan, he, he uh, sells the shop with the loan got, and with the profit, he's paying the other children who are not in the program. Yeah. So that is like the benefit indirectly from the organization. Yeah. yeah. Despite the challenges that Acholi Quarter has faced, it remains a place of hope and inspiration. Its people are a testament to the power of community and to the incredible strength that can arise from even the most difficult circumstances. Now, before she joined the, our program, she had a small saloon up there. So with the loan she got, she changed from saloon work to a wholesale shop and retail. She has a lot of passion in here. So she decided to reopen another uh, hairdressing store oh. while she hires somebody to sell for her at the shop. Mm. Uh, yes. Yeah, really yeah. entrepreneur. A lot of impact. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I continue my walk with Nicholas and Susan. I think I need a haircut. We're meeting more people and hearing more heartwarming stories. the company manager doing politics. Company manager, company manager, company manager. I'm meeting the, the future president of Uganda. Yeah. <laughs> Talking to the locals, I'm struck by their warmth a sense of humor, and unwavering determination to create a better life for themselves and their families. They party, they party crazy here. <laughs> like music is everywhere, loud. And then uh, this is a community where but pork is on a higher level, high demand. Pork? Pork. Yeah. Because of the high consumption of alcohol, <laughs> then the partying, they're always like eating a lot of pork. And yeah, it's really lively. Yeah. Really lively. When it's basically because now there's sun, there's it's very hot. But even in time when it's calm, yeah. it's very busy. Yeah. Nice community. I noticed that some guys are having drinks in the middle of the afternoon. It got me thinking, so I turned to Nicholas and asked him if alcoholism is a problem in this community. Yeah, alcoholism is an issue and it has a lot of uh, crime rates as well as domestic violence. Because uh -huh. here, they believe that a woman has to work and respect the husband. Uh -huh. But mostly, the husband drink a lot and have a lot of fun. Yeah. Nicholas went on to explain that due to the high unemployment rate, and lack of education, many people here end up turning to alcohol as a way to escape their problems. And, uh, so in the process of drinking, they go home. That's when they have a lot of domestic violence and all that. They spend the money on booze instead of providing food for the families. Because most of them they are not allowed to work by their husbands because it's cultural. Most women aren't even allowed to work by their husbands. They have to just stay home. Then the husbands are the ones to work and bring whatever they have to, to bring home, to eat and all that. But because they are mistreated, most of them wanted to start working. But as they face mistreatment, they yearn to start working. We are trying to open up a lot for them and it was hard. They were like, I cannot come out to work at this time because my husband will beat me up, my husband will do this. Yeah, but lucky enough, it's changing. That's why if you saw, the good thing you saw our small business program, the people, yeah. Yeah. the mostly ladies. Yeah. So which is very good at the moment. It's heartening to see that progress is being made here. So it has been very positive in the community. Yeah. Yeah. But there's still a lot of work to be done to address these issues, partly rooted in the culture here. As we're heading to the stone quarry, let's have a look at the weather.
Kampala experiences a tropical savanna climate characterized by two rainy seasons and two dry seasons. The rainy seasons are from March to May and from October to November, when the dry seasons are from December to February and from June to August. During the dry seasons, when this is recorded, the temperature range from 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, that's 77 to 86 Fahrenheit, and the humidity is relatively low. The weather is pleasant and there's minimal rainfall, making it ideal for outdoor activities and sightseeing. So this is also the best time to visit Kampala, but that also makes it the peak tourist season, and accommodation and travel costs may be higher during this time. During the rainy seasons, Kampala experiences heavy rainfall and flooding is not uncommon. The temperature during this time ranged between 20 and 28 degrees Celsius, 68 to 82 Fahrenheit. Kampala is just 35 kilometers north of the equator, so temperatures doesn't change much. And overall, the area has a warm and comfortable climate throughout the year. And you can enjoy the city's attractions anytime. This episode is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best prices on hotels and guest houses and hostels around the world in one simple search. Hotels25.com The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. The Radio Vagabond. Gotta keep moving. On the top of the hill, we get to the stone quarry that we've heard Susan mention a few times. It's a site where workers extract and break stones and other construction materials located right here in the densely populated Acholi Quarter neighborhood. There's also a water hole after it's been raining. Susan calls this the beach. This is a stone quarry. Even here where we are walking, it was full of rocks like those ones. But we broke them all down, crushed them in two pieces. And now, as you can see, the area, stones are scarce. Yeah. And now when it rains and the pitch is filled with water, like you're seeing, then we have no work to do. No. And then uh, children, parents are going hungry on empty stomach. Yeah. yeah, That's why most of people had changed to beads. But again, when the epidemic came, uh, we lacked market and everybody went back to zero. People yeah. suffered a lot. Yeah. yeah. Working at the quarry can be physically demanding and a dangerous job. Many workers in the quarry are involved in the extraction of stone and other materials by breaking rocks using hand tools such as hammers and chisels. So men go down there and break this rock into medium pieces and then they bring them out. When they bring them out and the ladies and children crush them into smaller pieces. And uh, these stones are used for building these concrete houses. Yeah. So they use this for, for building. The work is strenuous and involves lifting heavy rocks and working in dusty conditions, which can lead to respiratory problems and other health issues. They use a lot of energy, a lot of time, but they're paid very little. Yeah. Because when you're crushing it, you crush it uh, full 20 liters, it is a 200 shillings, not even a euro. 200. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to start working from morning to sunset to at least get 1,000 shillings. As Susan mentioned, children can also be found working in the quarry, which is a serious concern due to the dangers involved. Children do that too. Even our children, before they were in the program, they used to do this. Children who work in the quarry often drop out of school to support their family because they can't afford to go to school. This deprives them of education and exposes them to physical harm and exploitation. But when we put them in the program, we stop them from doing this. Yeah. We give their parents uh, a boost of a business of loan and then we cater for their school fees, uh, uniforms, Feeding every Sunday, we cook hot meal in the office, and every child got to eat from. Yeah. But 22 stars are doing a lot to reduce child labor in the quarry. 
Together with other NGOs and government agencies, they've worked to raise awareness about the dangers of child labor and provide alternative education and livelihood opportunities for children and their families. Some of the initiatives include offering school fees and scholarships for children. And we give them, uh, we provide them with mosquito nets, mattresses, because they, with the little they earned from here, they couldn't afford buying a mattress or blanket or a mosquito net. We're standing looking down at the water hole where a few kids are swimming today. The water looks very dirty. And the thought of anyone drinking this water makes my stomach turn. And most of them who don't have access to clean water, they use this water, which is very dirty. But they donated for us clean water. Also, before they were making mud houses that would break down when it rained heavily, partly because of the slopes they're on. They were lacking a firm structure foundation, but 22 stars also helped with that. They used to live in a mud house, and when rain rain, would throw away a flood, and they were really in a very bad condition. But thanks to 22 Stars Foundation, we were able to have a fundraising and got a big donation. We have so far constructed more than 10 new houses. Just as we're about to leave the quarry, Nicholas and Susan introduces me to a woman who's lived in the quarry all her life with her parents and grandparents. This is a chance cove here. She's uh, the tycoon here. <laughs> she's the tycoon. <laughs> yeah. And she's worked here smashing and carrying rocks since she was just five years old. Like, she runs, I think she runs uh, this entire place. Yeah. She employs people to do the stone quarry uh-huh. then for her, then she sells it off. Mm. So that's why I say she's the tycoon here. She works smart. (laughs) But now things are changing for the better for her and her family. With the loan she got, she was able to employ other people to make the work easy for her. (laughs) She says she can't speak English, so I can translate for me. Uh, but you've spoke already. Uh-uh, I'm just learning. <laughs> but when when you were uh, a kid, did you also work here in the quarry? Yes. <laughs> How old were you when you started? Five years. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Instead of going to school, yeah. uh, you were five hammering years. rocks. Five years is when now she started crushing the stone seriously. But she was born while the mother was working here. So from like one week, they were already here crossing stone Even with the mother. Even her husband, which is working here on quarry. Yeah, <laughs> he was given to her, a husband who works in the quarry because uh, she wouldn't afford to go to school. The, the, the husband also was born here. They grew together in the quarry. They got married. They got children in the quarry here. So <laughs> Quarry kids. Quarry kids. Yeah. Quarry parents, quarry kids, quarry grandparents. Yeah. So the third generation is all quarry. But I think the fourth one is now getting the office. Because these children, they are all supported by us. They are no longer doing stone quarry. They are in school and very bright. You can see pictures, videos and links and read much more on the radiovagabond.com. That's it for this episode. Join me in the next one where Susan will tell her personal story. Next week on the Radio Vagabond. Uh, I was uh, 13 years old when I was forced into early marriage by my parents. Um, and by that time, I didn't know their reason. I was just mad, but later on realized they did that to protect me from being abducted from the LRA rebels. So stay tuned, and if you want to get involved somehow in supporting 22 Stars, either by donations or helping out in any other ways, go to foundation22stars.org. And if you're interested in becoming a wholesaler or just buying some of the amazing jewelry for yourself, go to 22stars.com. I know with the good impact we are doing, I know 
this is a new generation, new jobs. We are getting doctors, nurses, teachers, no more quarry. Yeah. So we are driving the poverty out, out of our community through education. That's yeah. why I have this shirt. Education is, is the, the key. key. And <laughs> it's the best way to drive disease and poverty out of the community. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, why I say... Out of Uganda. <laughs> Out of Africa, in fact. Yeah. Because when you are educated, they educate you about like HIV, about these chronic diseases, how to control yourself from getting infected from diseases. That's why I say it's the way to drive out diseases. Because you know, I got malaria, I have to go to the hospital and treat myself. But back then, no one thought about it. You get malaria and you're there. Some of them even say, I'm bewitched. This is black magic. And they end up dying because it's malaria. Yeah. It's nothing like black magic. But because they lack the education, yeah. they don't know that if I feel this sign, I have to see a doctor. They end up dying. And they don't know that I have to sleep under mosquito net to prevent getting infected with malaria, biting from mosquito, they are just open there. But when you're educated, you know I have to sleep under mosquito net. I have to protect myself from mosquito bites. I have to see a doctor in case I have a sign. Yeah. That's why if someone asking me, what is your favorite gift? I would say my favorite gift is taking children to school, finding them education. That would be my best gift in the world. Seeing the world change, seeing my community change makes me very happy, makes me forget my past, makes me feel like I've done something good to, to change the world. My name is Palabo, and I gotta keep moving. See ya. Radio Produced by RadioGuru.co.uk